everyone, and welcome to Great Day Houston. <laughs> okay, so 50 years ago this moment, Neil Armstrong was about 36 hours away from setting foot on the moon. Because they were the face of NASA, people have always been enamored by that elite group of people called astronauts. But before they could even board a flight, there's another group of NASA employees who had to lay the groundwork. We're celebrating one of those people today. Jerry Woodfield started at NASA 54 years ago when a moon landing was still just a dream. Please welcome Apollo 11 alarm system engineer, Jerry Woodfield to Great Day Houston. Good morning. <laughs> All right, Jerry, 54 years and you're still at NASA. Yeah, it's been a wonderful career and it hasn't stopped yet. I'm continuing. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go back 54 years ago. Uh, some other folks I, I talked to who worked for NASA, even like 1958, said that when they were offered a job, people looked at them and said, are you crazy? That's hocus pocus. What are you talking about? Uh, by the time you went to NASA, uh, what were your friends and family saying? They saying, thankfully you got a job. <laughs> You graduated from Rice University. It was the only offer I had, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> so I took it. Yeah. What did that mean to you, though? What did space mean to you at that time? Space meant to me to be some, part of something that would be everlasting. You know, a lot of things have happened in American history, but going to another body in space apart from Earth is something that will not be forgotten for a thousand years. Yeah. It's something new to some of the other astronauts that we've spoken to and other NASA employees said it was just a different time. Uh, America was still kind of riding that high from World War II, but then we kind of were falling out of grace, if you will, at that time. And so competing with the Russians made the space program even more of, a, of an endeavor. This was certainly a great incentive in order to be first and I mean, we already lost to the Soviets. Uh, they had orbited uh, dogs and then women, and, and, and our chimpanzees were ahead of the men. Yeah. I mean, we were having a horrible time, and uh, it was a big deal because the entire world looked on, you know, communism and then democracy and then faith and then those that said there is no faith. So it was very important that we achieve the goal of being first on the moon, yeah. and we did. I mentioned that you went to Rice University, and of course, that's where President Kennedy had that fa the famous speech of, we will get a man on the moon, right? And that inspired yeah. you. That, uh, yeah, I was there in Rice Stadium, and I heard President Kennedy said, we do this thing not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Yeah. Well, <laughs> getting a degree at Rice University as a lecturer was very hard. <laughs> Okay. And so he said that, I said, if we can go to the moon, I can graduate. <laughs> <laughs> you did graduate. Uh, you became an alarm system engineer. That's a big job, but explain to us what that is. Okay. When we go to the moon, one of the big difficulties I had is that leading that warning system team was to avoid all kinds of what we call nuisance alarms. You know, when you're driving along 45 and all of a sudden the oil light comes on, yeah. and there's really no problem. And you're but thinking, you don't know that, I, right? You're not you, quite sure. You have to be able to design into the lander a, a system that will avoid all nuisance alarms. And that was my challenge. I had to make that job done right because it wasn't done right. And Neil Armstrong was coming down with the Eagle toward Tranquility Base and then an alarm came on and he jerked the stick. He could just actually kill himself and Buzz Aldrin because of a master alarm, nuisance alarm. Yeah, yeah, all right. So uh, you handed out these bracelets today and they say the right stuff on them, and they also say you know, failure is not an option, right? Um, I have one on right here. Uh, okay, <laughs> but there's something else that you relied on to get through these missions, and you have it right next to you. You told me to bring my props. Yeah, <laughs> you, you brought your props, yeah. Here's my prop. Yes. Yeah. Your Bible. <laughs> This thing propped me up. It propped up my life, and it still does, Amen. and I recommend it to everybody. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, because if you're, if you're going to the heavens, you got to depend on the... Here's yeah, your prop. Yeah, all right, so you have this, too. I'm going to open this up, and this is so amazing to look at, and part of the reason why it's so amazing is that it's still handwritten. Okay, tell people what this is right here. When I was assigned the alarm system in 1966, I started this particular log book. You know, like Columbus had a log every day when he went to America. This is my log book of designing the alarm system, make sure we didn't have nuisance alarms. And every day for three years, I would talk to astronauts and engineers and flight controllers to make sure that that alarm system protected astronauts when they went to the moon. No, John Kennedy said it like this, send him and return him safely to the Earth. That was my direct job, to return the astronauts safely to yeah. the Earth. All right. 
go back to that moment and that when we're five, four, three, two, one, lift off. What was that like for you in that room? Well, of course, when we lifted off, that was wonderful. But actually, when they actually landed, as they landed, yeah. that was even more tense for me because my alarm system started to ring alarms. Yeah, because a lot of people think Apollo 11 was so smooth. No, there were some was, issues. There yeah. was problems just like on 13. And Eagle was coming down, and all of a sudden, the alarms start to come on. I said, oh, no, I'm going to keep Neil Armstrong off to noon. It, <laughs> it, 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 it's going to be another astronaut. But there were some very brilliant flight controllers that said, ignore Jerry's alarm system, bring it down. <laughs> However, I, you know, with the 50, I'm trying to let everybody know I discovered an alarm that would have ended the moon rock. It would have stopped the planting of the American flag. And they couldn't even have talked to President Nixon at Tranquility Base. Yeah. I discovered a nuisance alarm that while Neil Armstrong was trying to plant, the, it would have come on. And it would have had to run back and get into the eagle again and determine what the alarm was. And they'd had to forget the moon rock. And so you're seeing right here, Deborah, you're talking to the man that saved the moon wall. Yeah. <laughs> the man with the plan. All right. You have some things right here of kind of how that worked there, okay? <laughs> so show us with your, your this is like a little This model is here. my model. I bought it at the Space Center. <laughs> <used to. laughs> yeah. And in my, I think my grandson, it's missing one leg. Now, oh. Neil Armstrong wouldn't have appreciated that, you know, when he came down. But the whole process, I try to explain this, is there were two vehicles that went to the moon. The Columbia, the mothership, would orbit the moon while the Eagle went down and actually landed on the moon. And so while the Eagle was coming down towards Tranquility Base, my alarm starts coming on. So finally, they land at Tranquility oh, oh wait, Base. I have, to, I have to, inter to interrupt you. This is the part where they said, Houston? The eagle has landed. That's for <laughs> There you go. She's a great interview. <laughs> I got to admit, I was on the program 18 years ago, yeah. and she has not aged one bit. <laughs> What, what kind of a genetic do you have? Well, that, that was one of the, well, actually, I'm an alien. That's the deal. Oh, yeah. and I am, <laughs> That's appropriate. We don't age but from you, Mars. But right? you look no. great, you know? <laughs> Thank you. And so people don't know this. I'll share this Sunday. If you come out to the Wade Church at 11 uh, a.m. Sunday, I'll tell you all these stories. I've got some stories that nobody has ever heard about Apollo 11's landing. In fact, this book actually has a... Old Testament scripture that tells all about it, says who's going to get there, how we're going to do oh, it. Wow. Now, if that doesn't bring you to church on Sunday, I don't know <laughs> what will. Well, well. All right, Jerry, I'm going to end with this right here. Um, and I ask everyone who's worked for the space program uh, that I've interviewed, we can send a man to the moon, but we still can't. We can't. What? We still can't what? Can't, well, there's a lot of things we can't do, but that's why we're continuing to work. We haven't cured cancer altogether. Yeah. We'd like to do that, you yeah. know. We'd like to all get along, whoever we are together, yeah, wouldn't we? Right? Yeah. But, but we still can't get along. <laughs> I love that. There's love so it. many can'ts that really failure is not an option can affect every one of those issues that we're yeah. trying to deal with. Yeah. And this book helps it too. And then lastly, are we the only ones? Are we the only ones? <laughs> well, well, I've not, if I've, you not know met something. Any, I've not met anybody else in my career. <laughs> So we're not quite sure yet. I think you just sworn to secrecy and can't tell us. All right. <laughs> Jerry, it is such a pleasure to see you again. And thank you so much. Jerry is the Apollo 11 50th anniversary guest speaker this Sunday, 11 a.m. at the Way Church in Spring. For more information, visit waychurch.org and you can get the rest of those stories. Thank you very much. Godspeed to everybody.